right, so hopefully it's all on. So last class we were talking about uh, the film industry, history of, birth of the silence, the development of the five studios, the rating system, the Hayes Code. We noted that uh, like so much of content policy in this country, the industries prefer to self-police rather than have a strong regulator. Um, so here again we saw the studios self-enforcing their code. Uh, rather than submitting to an out-and-out -out kind of censorship regime. Um, and we also talked about the studios and their uh, eventual cooperation with uh, the House on American Activities, uh, inquiries into communist influence in the entertainment industry, uh, and how difficult that was. We noted 1939, a big year for Hollywood movies. Um, and in the 1940s, we talked about um, Hollywood's response to the rise of television uh, with increased technology. So uh, uh, the widescreen films, the Cinerama kind of gimmick, but then uh, Cinemascope becoming a, kind of an industry standard, which television couldn't rival. Uh, so film became, you know, uh, more pronouncedly a... Uh, a visual medium than television could be. Um, and we stuck with the television four by three aspect ratio uh, up until 2009 when we went to high definition television and we got uh, you know, our current widescreen uh, television uh, competing with uh, movies already. And so we've seen movies go to 3D and uh, uh, more immersive sound so on. So a bit of a, a bit of a race between television and movies to uh, for movies to keep keep the edge on um, technologically and experientially just to keep on inspiring folks uh, to come to the movie theaters. Good morning to all of you on chat. Uh, so just a reminder, and for those who might have missed it last class, uh, there is a for credit discussion up here about why we continue to go to the movies and uh, it brings in genres as well, whether maybe there are some kinds of films that you still would prefer to see in a movie theater and other things that you're happy enough to stream or even look on a small phone. So an opportunity there to, to weigh in on that and I see a few folks have, that's great. So this one's due by December, what, December 5th, so be sure to participate in that to get some uh, points just for a discussion. And if you can, uh, circle back and once you've posted, see what other people think or as you post, maybe I know you have thoughts of your own on this, but you might also interact with other people uh, to make it uh, an online discussion uh, rather than just a chance to post. But if it has to be that, then that's it. Uh, otherwise, we're also looking forward to your research paper number two. A list of uh, acceptable topics is there. Um, we're going to spend some time next week uh, dipping in one by one into those topics. We already talked about it last uh, week in the lead up to Thanksgiving. We'll talk about it again to try to give you more ideas about uh, how to write one of those essays where to look in the textbook for information, what kinds of, you know, uh, what kinds of argument in your essays would be, you know, good, appropriate. I can give you some pointers on that, I hope. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> so part two of this discussion about, um, about movie history and the movie business uh, gets into... Um, 1970s, the new cinematic golden age of director-driven films, which is also the moment that uh, the old Hollywood, the Hollywood studio system, uh, pretty much expires. Uh, and um, uh, a, a different balance in the movie industry emerges where uh, star names actually uh, have are, are determinant in financing uh, films. So stars getting 
way more power than they had under the studio system, where the studios tried to lock them into contracts and basically, uh, you know, make them conform to uh, to their business plans. Uh, you know, Hollywood of the 1980s on on uh, is an industry driven by stars and uh, even star um, star managers. You know, uh, the uh, the talent agencies that were able to put together uh, the big name directors, the stars, and the intellectual property to uh, to, to you know create the, the, the big blockbuster type modern films um, is is a different sort of organization than uh, than the studios who used to call the shots. The studios remain largely as brands and as distribution and financing mechanisms, but they're joined by all uh, uh, other uh, external sources of financing, just investors uh, who uh, enter into Hollywood to finance, you know, large slates of films. But whereas before, you know, the studios would have been involved 100% in financing the movies, uh, current, now, nowadays they, they'll have a hand, but also they'll be, uh, you know, significant um, uh, external investors. I mean, the name of the, the company called the Brat Pack and Brett Ratner uh, has come up uh, because of the, uh, the sex scandals in Hollywood recently. Uh, but there's, there's, for instance, a, a, the type of player that wouldn't have existed before the 1980s. You know, Brett Ratner bringing an enormous amount of capital into producing films, but he's not a, not a movie studio. Uh, Miramax, uh, Harvey Weinstein, also the you know the person who kicked off the sex scandals, um, you know th that that was uh, another independent studio, quote unquote, which really wasn't a studio in the sense of the early Hollywood studios, which would have you know real estate and a backlot and uh, you know droves of full-time employees. A Miramax would be like a Brat Pack would have executives. Um, Money raisers, basically uh, producers who would you know oversee production, but that's as far as it would go. So they're they're not like the the other studios. They would be, uh, the, you know, the studios of old. They're uh, more kind of financing companies with an oversight over production, but not you know not a factory to make movies. If you and uh, you know the 80s and 90s see uh, the the emergence of quality CGI, and uh, here we are today, blockbusters in the new millennium. Um, so the textbook points to the 2007 Writers Guild strike as a as an important moment, in a transition in um, you know taking emphasizing this trend towards blockbusters and existing, developing existing intellectual property into films that they feel have a, a really good shot at uh, success. So less risk taking going on in the industry and more attempts to just have a guaranteed success on your hands. Um, it's more efficient. Why is that more efficient? Because producing expensive flops is very inefficient. As we saw in the television industry, the whole pilot development process is also incredibly inefficient. You know, to shoot and launch uh, over a hundred shows a season and then only retain, you know, 25 of them and then have 15 of those go off the air within the first four or five weeks because they failed to reach an audience. That's television's inefficiencies, right? And, and many people have talked about how perhaps to eliminate that. Um, in the movie business, you know, the, the inefficiencies are films that, uh, that um, you know, uh, cost a lot of money and don't necessarily make it back. And it seems like the, uh, you know, just like it seems like baseball players are all swinging for home runs lately, because statistically that's what seems to work better. Um, Studios are all swinging for home runs in, uh, in, in their production of, uh, of films based on existing intellectual property. So we talked about the Marvel films and you know, superhero genres and stuff. And you know, right now, horror is having a pretty good time. So uh, you'll see 
you know, horror that's not necessarily based on existing uh, IP, but a lot of other, a lot of other genres of film, you know, basically, you know, are, are not being made anymore. Um, particularly, they talk about, you know, a mid-range budget of, let's say, 10 to 30 or 40 million dollars. They don't make a lot of those movies anymore. They make either very low budget films or massive huge budget films which are based on Marvel universes or things like that where, where they can hope to they can hope to make their money back you know so uh, this is t tied to the writers guild strike in the sense that the you know um, Hollywood screenwriters uh, um, the uh, the diversity and the quantity of output was uh, was clustered around original independent films and when they all took a strike in 2007 which affected television and film um, the studios had to move forward with stuff that was already written with existing ideas and they found that they didn't do any worse in the in the season or two after that than they had done before the writer's strike conclusion why are we paying for all those original scripts <laughs> right so uh, um, it just it just increase this tendency to you know bet on the sequel or bet on the, the existing property that everyone's heard of you know so so we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, uh, dusting off of, uh, of of material searching out you know the word franchise comes up a lot I guess what's meant by that is the idea that uh, if you get, you're looking for a film that not just, you know, be a hit first time out, but that can produce, you know, several more spin-offs and, uh, and and sequels to uh, to make it worth your while. And you know, even textbook mentions Lord of the Rings, where they, you know, shot three films back to back, you know, before they even released the first one. They they've done three of them with understanding that this was going to be a a, a big multi-film phenomenon, and they were right. So that just increased this. And uh, we talked about other technologies and stuff. What's important to say here, the food and drink service got better. We were talking about that, but you know, the, uh, uh, the, the main profit source for a film exhibitor is concessions. So. Um, they make more money off of selling you popcorn and drinks, or if you go to Alamo, beer and cocktails and, you know, pheasant, for all I know, uh, you can, uh, that's, that's what brings in the money, you know. So, um, uh, in, the, in the upgrading of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the cinema experience, you know, more comfortable seats, more expensive food, I mean, all of that works, you know, unbelievably towards the bottom line of the exhibitor, um, the you know distributor, who's making their money off of half of the ticket sales that they split with um, the cinema, may or may not be partaking in any additional profit. Um, I noticed the word out in Disney is asking. It's usually it's been 50-50 split for decades, 50% uh, to the exhibitor, 50% to the distributor of a film. So half your ticket should go to the distributor. But uh, Disney knows that they've got, you know, a new box office phenomenon on their hands, phenomenon, with the new Star Wars film. So they're asking for more. Um, I can't remember now. I think they're asking for 60%, something like that, 60-40 so split. So because they know that that's what everyone's going to be making money off of this Christmas. So they're willing to step over and step on the exhibitors because they can do it. Yeah. Sorry, Sandra? I said rude. Rude. Well, I think that's what the exhibitors think, you know, but Disney, Disney says, well, we got Marvel, we got Pixar, we got Star Wars, you know, basically no one's close to us in the movie industry. So through very, uh, through very, um, well, first of all, they have huge bags of money so they can buy whatever they want based on the theme parks. And then they decided, oh yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, if we buy Marvel, we get all those characters, we can make movies, we can make television shows, we can, you know, make fun rides. And then they did the same with uh, Star Wars. I mean, it just seems to me like Disney wants to own everything that anybody remembers. You know? <laughs> it's like, wow. Anyway, it's certainly, 
you know, television, ESPN hasn't helped them, but in film, they're dominant, dominant force. Amazing. And, and when I went to my little junket in Burbank, they were they had just bought Marvel. And it never occurred to me it would be such a great deal for them, but boy, is it ever, so that's why I'm not an executive. Um, so let's look at a crash course on this little bit of history here. Um, maybe we can play it a little bit short. <laughs> do, you, do you enjoy these? I find they go through kind of fast. <laughs> but what the heck. They're so fun to watch. They're, they're, I mean, they're really good. Um, there we are. So this one I started, this, this one covers the, um, since we enjoy this, let's see the whole damn thing. Started from the beginning. What's playing at the multiplex today? Another big budget sequel, the same old romantic comedy, yet another superhero movie? Probably that last one. A lot of time, Hollywood is driven by trends. The success of one film or genre inspires others to jump on the bandwagon. And that's how we end up with nothing but reboots and dystopian fantasies. The same thing happened after World War II. Audiences around the globe were getting tired of the films coming out of Hollywood, calling them artificial, self-important, and inauthentic. From the Italians in the 1940s to the French in the 1960s, and even independent directors at work today, filmmakers have found ways to challenge the classical Hollywood model by creating their own vibrant and original films. So let's talk about Italian neorealism, the French New Way, and all kinds of independent cinema. Are we gonna talk about Sharknado, Nick? <laughs> okay, good. Between the 1930s and the 1950s, the major American film studios perfected a particular style of filmmaking we call classical Hollywood cinema. Their stories were chaste, formulaic, and mostly upbeat. The good guys almost always won, and husbands and wives couldn't even share a bed. Many of the films were shot on constructed sets or the studio backlot, and most used a flat, generic form of lighting called high-key lighting that ensured the entire image was clearly visible. A lot of great films came out of the studio system, but Hollywood was churning out between six and 800 films a year and dominating the global film market. By the mid-1940s, audience were ready for something new. The first post-World War II movement to find its voice was Italian neorealism. Many of the filmmakers, like Roberto Rossellini and Vittorio De Sica, were working directors before the war and started shooting again as soon as the fighting ended. After living through that violent time, they craved a more raw and authentic style than classical Hollywood cinema could provide. Filmmaking tools for these guys ran thin. Cina Sitta, the film studio in Rome, was nearly destroyed during the war. Equipment was often damaged or missing, and film stock was hard to come by. But these resourceful Italian filmmakers found a way to turn these disadvantages into a style that reflected the harsh reality they saw around them. The first Italian neorealist film was Roberto Rossellini's 1945 masterpiece, Rome, Open City. Set and shot in the Italian capital just after the end of the war, the film tells the tragic story of a handful of characters living under Nazi occupation. Rossellini mixed non-actors with movie stars and filmed in and around buildings that had actually been bombed. The film has an extremely rough look, a plot that meanders from character to character, unexpected and shocking deaths, and an ambiguous ending. Nothing about this film screams classical Hollywood, and that's what helped turn it into a hit. Other Italian neorealists followed Rossellini Rosalini's example, focusing on stories that tried to reveal the authentic suffering of everyday people. Then, nearly two decades later, another film movement would take a different approach to the same problem. How do you make more authentic, irreverent movies than Hollywood? In the late 1950s in France, a group of opinionated young film lovers started writing for a movie magazine called Cahiers du Cinema. At the time, the mainstream French film industry was making a lot of unimaginative literary adaptations that mimicked the classical Hollywood style. Films like Jean Delannoy's The Little Rebels and René Clement's war drama Forbidden Games. And these young film critics hated them. In 1959, one of their most prominent writers, Jean-Luc Godard, wrote a scathing attack on 21 major French directors. Here's just part of what he said. Your camera movements are ugly because your subjects are bad. Your casts act badly because your dialogue is worthless. In a word, you don't know how to create cinema because you no longer know what it is. Ouch. The main argument for these critics was that the studio systems in both the United States and France were spoon-feeding their audiences rather than respecting their intelligence. Interestingly, some of the filmmakers these critics admired had worked in Hollywood during the height of the studio system. Directors like John Ford, Howard Hawks, Orson Welles, and Alfred Hitchcock. And this was even before Hitchcock was Hitchcock. At the time, he was considered a reliable maker of commercial thrillers. Successful, sure, but not a genius. These young French film critics, however, saw a filmmaker entirely in command of his medium, from story to cinematography to editing. 
They also admired a few contemporary French filmmakers, people like Alain René and Agnes Varda. Varda's work, particularly her use of non-professional actors, documentary realism, and real-life locations demonstrated that a vital, refreshing French cinema was possible. By the end of the 1950s, they had analyzed a boatload of contemporary cinema and were ready to start making films of their own. In 1959, four of them made their feature film directing debuts. Jean-Luc Godard shot Breathless, Jacques Rivette made Paris Belongs to Us, Claude Chabrol made his second film, Les Cousins, and Francois Truffaut directed The 400 Blows. Truffaut's film was selected to screen at the hugely prestigious Cannes Film Festival, where Truffaut won Best Director. Suddenly, these scrappy young critics were being recognized as major international film stars, and it put French New Wave on the map. This style involved making films swiftly with minimal crews and lightweight equipment. Like Wheezy Waiter. Actually, no crew for Wheezy Waiter. Advances in camera technology, along with faster film stocks, allowed them to shoot with available or natural lighting instead of hauling around lights. The film's plots often felt spontaneous and absurd, featuring tangents, casual and irreverent humor, a frank approach to sexuality, and sometimes obscure cinematic references and in-jokes. French the Llama, that's neat! They used lots of tricks to remind audiences they were watching a movie, to really play with that illusion of reality, things like jump cuts or characters talking directly to the camera like Wheezy Waiter. But their goal was to capture something really authentic about life in post-war Europe. And even though the Italian neorealism and French New Wave styles got fancy names, this shift wasn't just happening in two countries. New generations of filmmakers began challenging the classical Hollywood style all over the world, from similar New Waves in Brazil, England, and Spain, to post-war Japanese cinema, and the rise of the post-colonial third cinema movements in Africa and South America. In a couple episodes, we'll spend some time examining world cinema in more detail. Meanwhile, in the United States, that 1948 antitrust lawsuit we mentioned last time, United States versus Paramount Pictures, Inc. forced the major studios to give up their theater chains. Suddenly, the marketplace was theoretically open to all kinds of films, not just whatever the biggest studios wanted to show in theaters. The Hollywood studios were stubborn, though, and didn't want to give up their money and control to the tidal wave of brash young filmmakers that were sweeping the rest of the world. But as the 1950s rolled into the 1960s, the studios found themselves in real trouble. Boy, howdy. After losing their theater chains, they began facing stiff competition from a little thing called television. As 1970 approached, the baby boom generation was coming of age, the war in Vietnam was in full swing, American politics was at its most violent since the Civil War, and studio films seemed increasingly out of touch. Ticket sales were falling, and studio executives were in an outright panic. Studio executives like money, you guys. So, in the late 1960s, a set of films seized the opportunity to challenge the studio system from both inside and outside. Two New York-based magazine writers, David Newman and Robert Benton, wrote a script called Bonnie and Clyde about a pair of charismatic Depression-era bank robbers on a crime spree. Their goal was to create an American film in the style of the French New Wave, and in fact, they almost got Truffaut to direct it. Arthur Penn directed the film instead, starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, and after winning over some influential critics, it became a sensation. With its unapologetic sexuality, casual humor, and surprise surprisingly brutal violence, Bonnie and Clyde was a watershed moment in the history of American film. It was made by Warner Brothers, but the film's success led to a cascade of independent films, films made outside the major studio system. In 1969, Dennis Hopper partnered with Peter Fonda to make a motorcycle road movie set to a contemporary rock and roll soundtrack. Produced on a shoestring budget, Easy Rider became a massive financial and cultural success. In many ways, these two films, along with movies like The Graduate in 1967 and Midnight Cowboy in 1969, ushered in an era of surprisingly personal, idiosyncratic American filmmaking and proved that unique original films could also make money. And so could Dustin Hoffman. At the same time, the older generation of studio executives began to retire. They probably were okay, though. They probably... Retired on a beach somewhere, very nice. In their place came a new crop of Hollywood decision makers who were shaped by the same societal forces as the younger filmmakers, like the rise of the counterculture and Watergate era politics. Suddenly, filmmakers with original visions who wanted to tell risky stories could get financed by major Hollywood studios. And that's the way it stayed until this day. Nope. Directors like Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma, and Robert Altman were supported by big studios and made films that reached an audience hungry for something new and fresh on screen. This window of creative control and experimentation came to be called New Hollywood Cinema and lasted from about 1967 to 1980. And it came to an end for a few major reasons. Many of these new Hollywood filmmakers began working with larger and larger budgets, which put more pressure on them to succeed at the box office. For every Apocalypse Now, a film that seemed like a disaster that turned out to be a success, there was a Heaven's Gate, a film that appeared to be a sure bet that flopped so hard it ruined a studio. And at the same time, filmmakers like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas were creating movies like Jaws, Star Wars, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Heard of them? Instead of overtly wrestling with the socio-political upheaval of the 60s and 70s, these films offered a chance to escape, a more pure form of entertainment that appealed to a wider audience. These were the first summer blockbusters, and their unexpected success signaled a swing away from the more risky personal films of the previous decade. Plus, as all this was happening, the studios were being purchased by large multinational corporations, which changed the way the studios worked. 
No one, ever, no multinational corporation ever purchases me. Gone were the days when <laughs> cigar chomping studio boss decided which films got made based on his gut instinct. Instead, there were stockholders to satisfy, marketing departments to consult, and risk assessment to consider. Very corporate. Ah, I love me some risk assessment. Film had always been a mix of art and commerce, but this period of blockbusters and corporate culture forever changed that balance. The major studios spent much of the 1980s making big movies that appealed to as many people as possible. Films like E.T., Back to the Future, Die Hard, and Dirty Dancing. And once again, the more unusual American films had to find other funding. The 1990s saw the arrival of a new set of independent filmmakers and mini studios. Directors like Spike Lee, Steven Soderbergh, Paul Thomas Anderson, and Quentin Tarantino made films for independent companies like Miramax and New Line Cinema. It's not a coincidence that many of these filmmakers came of age admiring the films of the new Hollywood cinema. And while they didn't have the resources of the major film studios, the success of films like Do the Right Thing, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, and Pulp Fiction show that there was still a hunger for risky original American films that continues to this day. Today we talked about the rise of post-war film movements that reacted against the classical Hollywood filmmaking style. We saw the influence of Italian neorealism and the French New Wave on the new Hollywood cinema filmmakers of the 1970s. And we discussed the rise of the blockbuster of the 1980s and the resurgence of independent and filmmaking in the 1990s. Next time we'll look at home video and how streaming services like Netflix and Hulu are a major force in recent film history. Crash Course Film History is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. You can head over to their channel to check out a playlist of their latest amazing shows like PBS Infinite Series, It's Okay to Be Smart, and Gross Science. This episode of Crash Course was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio with the help of these risk assessments. And our amazing graphics team is Thought Cafe. He talks really fast. He does. That but he like, enunciates well. Yeah, like, yeah, but like my head is almost spinning because of you. <laughs> so wait. It's a crash. It's a crash course. Go somewhere. I have a question. Yeah. So he called Miramax an independent film studio? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I thought that the take, I didn't know who Harvey Weinstein was before all of this stuff Scandal. happened. Yeah. But. I th my takeaway from when that all started coming out was that he was one of the m biggest guys in Hollywood, the most untouched, like the Weinstein brothers were, you know, the Hollywood elites that were the, the upper echelon of the upper echelon. How is Miramax an independent film? Like, I, I would have thought that was the yeah, most yeah. unindependent, like the, you know, yeah. big wig film studio. I, I guess I guess I guess the ups the upstarts of one era become like okay. the major figures mm -hmm. of the next. But so in the long history that he's telling, you know, the studios were you know RKO, 20th Century, um, uh, 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 Warner Brothers, so on and so MGM. forth. Yeah, MGM, thank you, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and United Artists. Mm -hmm. So those would have been the ones coming out of the 1930s that, that okay. you know, persisted. And even to this day, they're still brands and, and they, mm -hmm. you know, they, but they've been bought by, you know, foreign companies and stuff. So, so compared to those guys, that's what they mean by the independent producers. And, and I guess the other thing is that they were tapping money from, you know, Saudi American, Saudi, sorry, Saudi Arabia and Saudi America. <laughs> it's like, we'll get there. Yeah. Saudi, Saudi American uh, uh, financiers and stuff. So their money was not coming out of the typical Hollywood money pool. Uh, it was it was coming from all over. You know, uh, from uh, uh, you know Sony got into it in a big way too. So so they, they from outside of the typical Hollywood movie business. Yeah, but it's true. You know. It, it, I mean, Miramax had a string of hits, you know, right. Shakespeare in Love, and uh, I mean, you know, Pulp Fiction, and all, all those huge independent films. That's it. So, so in part, in part, they're talking about where the financing came from, and in part, they're talking about that sensibility of, you know, we're not just going to make another out of Africa epic romantic film or something. We'll do something, you know, that squeezes together film noir and comedy and, and a million other things and, and you know very much inspired I guess by the the other independents like the, the earlier wave of independence. The new Hollywood cinema or the or the Europeans and that, that they talked about before. Anybody a film buff or anything? Did you see any of your favorite films come up in there or or anyone aware of that history that he was talking about already? That Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now, yes. Is that a favorite? Pretty. It's different. It's very different. Jenny, did you want to say something? No? 
Okay. Uh, Lost Ark, Indiana Jones. I really love Indiana Jones. Those Indiana. early blockbusters? Yeah. Yeah. That was... Uh, Citizen Kane, Orson awesome Welles. Awesome yes. Awesome sure. So that would that was an RKO picture. So technically that was a studio picture, but, but um, RKO was in decline and Orson Welles was, you know, his own thing. Was, he wasn't able to make too many films after that. Just he was because done he, after that. Yeah, he would just get the financing and then live live high for a while, and then you know, like launch another project that didn't get finished and stuff. So. I like the movies that he mentioned from the um, end of the '80s and like the '90s to the right thing and Pulp Fiction. Like those directors that like the four directors that he mentioned for Spike the Lee. '90s: Spike Lee, Soderbergh, um, Tarantino, and um, Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. yeah, it's the sensibility of them. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I just really like the movies from <laughs> yeah. these directors. Yeah. I never like thought of that, like divided by decades. I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, again, this this reminded me that Spielberg and Lucas really are in a you know you could classify them apart from yeah. those other people. You know, even, you know, just because of the the degree of their success and their you know, their, their talent for connecting with a huge audience, you know, versus, well, I mean, then look at Soderbergh, right? I mean, from Sex, Lies, and Videotapes to Ocean's Eleven, which was like a total crowd pleaser, you know, um, the guy, you know, developed into, um, you, you know, the stature of a, of a Hollywood studio director, you know, a John Ford or whatever, I mean, in my view, anyway, but it's not just talent, it's also success. And the times. I mean, Spielberg and, um, oh God, what's his name? Lucas? Lucas. Both were creating films when these new technologies were emerging. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to like capture audiences and nostalgia and be remembered that way in a way that like, I think new directors don't have a chance to, I mean, it's odd. We're having new technologies all the time, but I, that was such like a, like what were we talking about? Like way, way at the beginning of the course, like, um, when new technologies happen so fast that like you go from like having like on the timeline you have like one technology one technology and then all of a sudden you have like fifty thousand. well they like came in right before the cluster of technologies in cinema happened so not to discredit their accomplishments <laughs> no but accelerated change <laughs> sorry accelerated change yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah 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 moore's law right which is yeah, yeah. it was originally regarding uh, computer processing but you know, you could apply it to other technological developments for sure. Yeah, yeah and also it adds like this whole nostalgia thing that you said because a lot of, you know, this generation grew up watching the movies, especially Spielberg movies. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. most of us, you know, our childhoods or whatever, yeah. <laughs> we can name like so all, all his movies <laughs> that we watched when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. So did you guys see Stranger Things? We had oh, the yeah. script. We had the yeah. script yeah. open last class. So, I mean, you probably, you know, I'm doubly nostalgic because I'm a generation older, but I think yeah. you guys saw plenty in there that was mm -hmm. very self-consciously placed there, right? They do lots of references in that show, too, to, like, all the 80s movies. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's oh, yeah, they're shamelessly movie. trying to capitalize on nostalgia, like... <laughs> But they kind that of works. work it in to where it's good. <laughs> oh, yeah, they do it well. <laughs> people love nostalgia. Yeah. Like, people love, like, you know, give it into those things. Yeah. But then you watch, like, Star Wars Episode Seven, and it all feels kind of forced yeah. a little bit. Just oh, like, yeah. Really they sucked me in. You guys want to see this? I mean, I was aware of the, uh, of the, I was aware of some referencing, but Check it out side by side. Just, and again, you don't fault them for this. I think it's pretty amazing they were able to do it. It's a, it's a Netflix, 10-part uh, Netflix series, uh, which was released last summer, and they just released the second, uh, a second series. Like a, so it was just kind of an unexpected breakout. The story is uh, set in a little town in the 80s. Uh, uh, group of friends, one of their friends disappears, and they through this strange girl who's sort of this girl who is really discovering like life and stuff. And you 
find out she's sort of involved in another dimension. So, uh, gets <laughs> pretty sci-fi. <laughs> Yeah, it made me think of the more than anything else. Uh, for me, it was E.T., but E.T. Yeah, was, e was a much more you know, influential film for me. Like when she, when Eleven dresses up, she's so E.T. Barb. Barb. Barb was a big out here. Barb. Barb. So I would have caught maybe 10% of this, but somebody went through and found every single reference. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's in front of the TV. the one I picked up. <laughs> I thought her dress looked like the twins yeah. from The Shining, you know, yeah, where yeah. they're, which now they're bringing up. I, I missed most of these. That's what I was thinking, you know, I was... A hell of a lot. Why wouldn't I? Wow, what a great... Yeah. Same, same. The cool thing about the internet, there's always one person who's willing to do a lot of work. Deep down, <laughs> rightfully become successful. <laughs> They did 30 other takes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cool. That's it. All right. Wow. Least of it all. Good for you, man. Very cool. Incredible. Yeah. So, uh. There's a number two. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. There's a second one of these, really? When she's trying to move the big train thing, it's like the same as when Luke is trying to lift the big <laughs> string out of. Yeah, was the lake. Oh, okay. I skipped yeah, all of was kind of. I watched it for like five minutes. I was like, I can't find it. Because oh, they didn't do so anything there. with the other characters. She's just like, <laughs> like there, and then she's gone. There, so you watch. Just like, this, this that little gang of girls. Well, I guess, I mean, m to tie that back to our discussion, so that wasn't <laughs> completely just a diversion. But, you know, if if. Uh, um, those films of the 80s, you know, like uh, the, the links from Spielberg, uh, let's just say that those people, as, as original they, as they were, were also taking a page out of the French New Wave, out of, and even out of the classic Hollywood cinema. The scene in uh, E.T. E where the frogs are all, this is like, it's a minor scene, but there's, you know, uh, uh, Elliot's in high school or in middle school or whatever, and they do a science experiment with frogs. And he liberates all the frogs. And uh, it's directly quoting some kind of Hollywood prison escape film, which I can't remember.
remember the title of it anymore. So Spielberg studied up as much as the Duffers brothers did, you know, uh, in a way that probably the earlier generations, I mean, they were making it all up as they went along, right? They didn't, they didn't have too many models in the 1930s and 40s. They were, they were building it, you know, but um, so, I mean, we could tie it back in that way just to say, another thing is, you know, every new medium, you know, pulls on the old media as well. So, you know, the, the Duffer brothers are continuing along history of, you know, uh, looking at what worked before and bringing it into a new thing like Netflix streaming or stuff. So, so where were we on this? I mean, uh, um, the studios get bought up. George Lucas, of course, is still complaining. Um, <laughs> focus group to death. I, I guess, you, you know, the financial pressure of putting so much money into a movie means that you're, you know, trying to guarantee success in every way. So increased research of the type we were talking about, you know, where you get focus groups together and they watch and respond. And then, you know, if the studio is powerful, like Disney apparently is, and, uh, uh, they, they'll dictate um, how these things get made, right? The most recent Star Wars, they fired the director. They put in Ron Howard at the last minute. I think he just finished the reshoots like a couple of weeks ago, and the film is coming out in two weeks from now or something. So uh, uh, because Kathleen Kennedy, who's the producer of E.T., who now works doing Star Wars for Disney, you know, fired, fired the original director because they were just, it wasn't working the way they wanted it to work. So, uh, so. Uh, do, do directors not have contracts? Sure, yeah. And they can just buy them anyway? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. You know, I don't know whether they even, they'd probably just consider buying someone that's out if they that. had to. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like if there's like a $10 million penalty, big deal if your film's going to make a billion, you yeah. know, or you're planning on it. So uh, I have a feeling that, um, and there's always agreements about editorial rights and stuff like that in contracts. Like so, so um, yeah. Uh, so, so part of the business, you know, the, the in in the '90s with with the rise of the blockbuster and and you know nothing wrong with blockbusters, right? I mean, the films we're talking about with such affection were blockbusters. Uh, they were, you know, like Indiana Jones is directly harking back to the B movies of, a, of the 1950s and stuff. So, you know, they, but but they were re, re, remaking them in a way that really worked for those audiences. But you know, the smaller independent films, those those original ideas moved over into uh, uh, another another kind of uh, the major studios would continue to go after the blockbusters. Many of them created uh, independent wings, like Sony Pictures Classics, for instance, was a very big one starting in the 1990s, still operating today, uh, which would reduce, I'm sorry, would, would reduce, they would, they would show films with you know, a, a, a more modest budget, uh, targeting at smaller niche audiences, maybe just releasing in large, uh, large uh, cities and stuff. Uh, so not not rolling it out in thousands of screens over the country, but focusing in a few places, and building you know awards buzz as Miramax was doing with their films early on, uh, but they got really big. Sony Pictures Classics and and uh, um, some others, New Line Cinema was another. Uh, so they would produce the films for you know uh, smaller niche audiences, connoisseurs, um, and their business has largely been disrupted by Netflix and Amazon, basically. Um, that that want to um, th they'll pay way more upfront for currently for independent films that they want to premiere on Netflix or on Amazon. Um, what can we say about that? I mean, in, 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 it's, you know, Netflix has gigantic coffers of money. Uh, it's hard for a small independent studio like Sony Pictures Classics to, you know, to compete. Um, Amazon did a deal with Woody Allen, who normally would go with one of those companies. Um, Netflix uh, snapped up something. I'm blanking on it recently. Um, however, one of, one of the issues is... Got, uh, David Lynch to do the Mindhunters. Show. He directs. Interesting. So those are the TV shows. But hang on, Jenny's got her hand up. Yep. Um, just to give a little background about Sony, I, I was there when they first started, when they were under construction. I was there when they opened up because I was 
being mentored by the marketing team. So Sony put about forty million to build the Metreon, and wow. IMAX was their little theater to cater to that niche audience. But as, as you were mentioning, more than likely with the rise and dominance of um, digital media and things like Netflix and whatnot, they started to lose money. So they sold their um, they sold their building, they sold their rights to Westfield, which Westfield is a very big owner of a lot of malls. Yeah. And then they also let out their little niche theater to AMC. Interesting. Yeah. And now it's it's a nice theater, but it it's not a Sony. Still is. No, it's not. Interesting. Cool. Well, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so uh, what we're seeing is, the, you know, the independent movies going over to the streaming services, or at least the streaming services, you know, uh, coming in with a lot of money that uh, those, those you know, those small studios uh, that typically did independent movies can't compete with as much. So um, one of the issues now is uh, the exhibition window, they call it, uh, which is basically, you know, with... The emergence of video and DVD, um, that was great for the studios because, uh, you know, even though ticket sales have been sort of slowly declining and now faster declining, um, they were able to make back with rentals, DVD sales, uh, the money that they were losing in movies, theater attendance, plus more. You know, it was actually, they were doing quite well with the combination of revenue streams. Now with streaming, um, you know, it, you've got Amazon and Netflix, which are controlling those points of distribution, which, you know, Blockbuster didn't use to control the studios the way that Amazon and Netflix can now. So uh, this is, it, it's, uh, there's a more direct competition between, uh, between the studios and things like Netflix and Amazon. Um, and so the, the, the amount of time that you give to a film to exist in the movie theater before somebody could rent or buy it for home viewing uh, is, is, is a contentious issue because the movie theater chains want it to be long enough so that they can you know, get a good 60 or 90 days where nobody could see the new Star Wars before they could stream it. Uh, but increasingly, Soderbergh, for instance, uh, put his latest film out both in cinemas and streaming uh, simultaneously, uh, figuring, well, whichever way we make money is the way we're going to make money with this. Who cares if, you know, I, I, I don't care whether people watch it streaming first and then I'd like them to see it in the movie theater, but big deal. So that's, that's something that uh, um, even the, you know, the association of, of uh, film exhibitors is uh, dealing with the studios such as they are to, to keep that window open. So otherwise, they're, you know, they're, the risk is that they'll have further declines in their business. Because you know? um, some people may write in that discussion, hey, I go see a movie because it's the latest thing and I have to go see it in the movie theater. You know? um, so there's your streaming options, and um, most ticket revenues go to studios. Theaters make money from concessions. We mentioned that, and Disney is helping themselves to a little more this, this Christmas. Um, da, 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 yeah, so we talked about that. Crowdfunding is an option for independent filmmakers. Anyone heard of any yet, Gino? But I have like a difference. Oh, go ahead. Whatever. Because yeah. I, I was looking at the screen, I was wondering, do you think Netflix would probably come out with some kind of like Netflix I don't know. If possible. I don't, say if you were like a member, you would go to them. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's an interesting idea whether whether that would be of interest to them or not. Um, Aren't they producers in part now? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, for instance, they put out a Kari Fukunaga film uh, about child soldiers in Africa with Idris Elba in it, like a few months ago, and uh, that was one that Netflix, because Kari Fukunaga demanded that. He's a Bay Area filmmaker. He did True Detective season one. And anyhow, so he demanded that there be some theatrical before it went to Netflix. And so Netflix did put it out theatrically. I mean, in part, that's hoping to get an Academy Award nomination as well, right? If your movie doesn't go into the movie theaters, then you can't even get nominated. Um, so they, 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 they did that. But they, so in some ways, I mean, they could just put it in, they could make a distribution deal with any of the 
you know, major distributors and then sort of say, okay, uh, you know, we've got a partnership. We don't have to have Netflix movie theaters. We just put our Netflix films out through the same pipeline that any other studio would, you know, um, which, which is a different business move for them because typically they just buy stuff to put on their streaming platform, right? As, as Jenny says, you know, they, they are massive amount, producers of massive amounts of content, mostly television, you know, serial television, but uh, they're doing that more and more. Um, so my, my question was just fishing around for crowdfunding things, but um, and, you know, I'm sure we'll easily find stories out there about films that we've seen that were crowdfunded into existence. Uh, unions making a living in the biz. Oh yeah, okay. So um, here's the idea that you, you know, uh, people moved out to California and Los Angeles and it became Hollywood film production center of the world basically you know, in part good to good weather, cheap real estate, uh, diversity of locations, and then the, the business slowly building itself up there. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Los Angeles is a union town. Just everybody working there pretty much in the film industry uh, is, is going to be involved in at least one union. Uh, and so they make it more expensive to produce films there. Uh, and so there's been a certain amount of runaway production going to uh, cities like Vancouver in Canada or here in the United States, basically to whichever state will provide interesting tax incentives to uh, a production company. Uh, Atlanta right now is a huge production center because Georgia gives great tax incentives to bring production there. So Walking Dead is shot there uh, and a lot of uh, 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 smaller budget feature films are shot there. Uh, there are other states that I'm sure are going to compete for that kind of production money. Um, so they call that runaway production because it's, it, they're not shooting in Los Angeles or in New York for that matter. Which is, both of those places are very expensive to shoot in because of the unions uh, that you know, keep salaries high, keep working conditions human. Uh, which means you know, they can't make you work an 18 hour day because the union says it's 10 and above that it's like super overtime and stuff. So. Those productions are, are kind of gone there, uh, moving, moving elsewhere. Um, uh, entry level careers at the entertainment industry are competitive. Yeah, uh, uh, there's um, what to say about that. I mean, uh, there's. Basically, people, um, when I was in LA, anybody would always dream. The majority of people living there would always dream of being a big movie star. And one of the things that they went ahead and did is literally line up for any type of job whatsoever. And there was even a website where it would list it if you're willing to work for free. So doing things like commercials, uh, yeah. they, they would do, just yeah. for the sake of having a resume, having experience, and getting your face out there. Absolutely. As, uh, yeah. If any producer even saw you in a, a low budget uh, commercial, you could potentially uh, escalate or elevate from there. Gotcha. Yeah, for performers. I could say for, for uh, technicians, uh, similar type of deal. A lot of people get on, you know, as drivers, basically, because you know, people got to drive to locations and stuff like that, uh, and then hope to move into, you know, uh, camera or lighting or, or sound or some, one of the technical field parts. Again, in Hollywood, the, a lot of those jobs would go to the children of other union members, I hate to say, and things like that, they're, you know, uh, but outside of Hollywood, there'd be more, more options there for being technical. On the creative side, it's a whole different story. Uh, the kind of entry level positions, people go to talent agencies. Uh, if you're a writer, there are lots of jobs reading scripts written by other people. You know, industry executives don't have time to even look. And in fact, they may open themselves up to uh, lawsuits by, you know, I wrote Star Wars, you, I sent you the script. I can prove it. I have, I have the, the post office, you know, uh, uh, registered mail. Uh, so, so they won't even open scripts. They hire people to, to, you know, in talent agencies basically to read the scripts and try to, so that's one of the entry level jobs in the creative area or, you know, working in independent production companies that do television or film um, and hoping to get on as a writer there. Uh, there's a whole, you know, reality TV kind of underbelly as well, which, you know, 
you don't necessarily have to have uh, the kinds of skills necessary to make big line feature films. Um, but you can, you know, if you're willing to work 18 hours a day and, and be one of like 15 camera operators on a reality TV show, um, there's, there's, there's entry level work there too, in technically and stuff. And so typically you won't get a full time job there. You'll be a private contractor and have to take care of your own health insurance and that kind of stuff. So on the technical side, eventually you're going to get involved with the union. On the creative side, you're not, but you're going to burrow your way into some kind of uh, um, uh, subcontracted company working for one of the new studios, if you want, because there's a lot of them doing television as well. Um, so, that, I mean, that's such a brief overview. It's ridiculous, but that's kind of the way it goes. Anybody uh, working on a film and television career? Something like that? Not yet. I don't know, Richard. I want to work then. <laughs> okay, but, but it happening. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh. Well, you know, Jenny's saying that companies, uh, you know, advertising work for free. That is often. I don't the, remember the, way the to website, but there is a website where you can list whether you're willing to work for a certain amount or willing to work for free, or if you are more polished, you, know, you name your you name your salary and your your stipulations and so. Forth. Daniela? Well, I was definitely, because I, first I was studying film, I was definitely more interested in the film industry, but then as I started to get to, get to know it better, I was like, no, this is not really for me. So I'm more interested in, like, um, like educational media now. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Or like, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I mean, documentary filmmaking, I'm more interested in that, or... Or even something like these crash courses that we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, like, either. you know, any kind of more like real stuff. Like, what I mean real is not... Not TRL. Yeah, no, <laughs> not um, non-fiction. Uh -huh. so I'm more interested in non-fiction now than in, you know, feature films. Like, uh -huh. I, I can't see myself, like, having to go to LA to work for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, good news is Silicon Valley seems to be getting into content production, yeah. you know, in a bigger and bigger way. Maybe LA won't be the mecca forever. Um, yeah, and I think it's it's very realistic to say, you know, those 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 big feature films that we go to see and love are, you know, like it's like getting a job as an astronaut, you know. Yeah. I would uh, watch them than make them, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> or then try to get into that business. Yeah. yeah. Okie doke. Uh, other issues that we hear a lot about, uh, apart from the sexual sca sex scandals, which is, you know, are just daily, and, and it's pretty horrifying hearing all this stuff. Um, uh, you know, but uh, prior to that was the uh, lack of diversity scandal, uh, which uh, which we shouldn't forget. Uh, the textbook has specific statistics, and they're not reproduced on the slides here. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, just lamentable lack of diversity in major roles on, in front of the camera and in, in um, behind the camera. Uh, again, you know, um, you know, brilliant work about all sorts of identities comes from creators of all sorts of identities. But uh, you then you, you can say that, but then when you look at, you know, the idea that, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of like directors are just like something like three, three to one, uh, our directors are white male. Uh, I mean, you know, look in the textbook for the exact uh, stats that, as they've pulled them together. And it's like the executives that actually green, right, green light and make these decisions, it's like, 90% white men, uh, you know, and so it's uh, it's certainly uh, um, a lack of diversity there. Um, and I think things are changing, particularly in television. Jenny? With the mention of the Oscars, I remember a lot of actors were spreading the word about boycotting it because yeah. a lot of the not only winners, but the nominees of the Oscars were largely um, Caucasian, and any role of diversity 
was either not considered or ignored, um, mm -hmm. and that's why they were saying boycott. Yeah, yeah. From 2014, blackest Oscars ever, to like 2016, uh, uh, Oscars so white, right? That was the hashtag, and, and it was like some some uh, good films had been overlooked for that. And it, I, I I don't remember what about 2014 was blackest Oscars ever. Uh, they're again they're listed in the uh, textbook, but um, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. 2014. I mean, we could Google it, but at least. Yes. This year, La La Land won the best picture or something. Uh, yeah, well, that was last year. La La Land won best picture. This was right? this year, 2017. Yeah. Yes, gotcha. Right, this spring. Because yeah. uh -huh. they accidentally yeah. said Moonlight. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, way. Moonlight won. Moonlight, they Moonlight and they said. La La Land. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. I'm totally blanking. What a. Steve that was so yes. horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that makes wow. me really uncomfortable to think about. Major mistakes. <laughs> oh my god. So anyways, uh, movie studios. Uh, hi. Okay, well that's our last slide, so maybe we can wind up on that. Um, play from current slide. I have the Kahoot going, but we don't have time. Let's do it next, next class. Um, Movie studios no longer strictly in the movie business, for sure. A lot of them seem to be like developing products to merchandise, right? Your latest round of toys coming out of, uh, so there's partly that. Studio Vex, yeah. So, the, I mean, this has been something people have been talking about for, a, a, you know, since, since I've been listening anyway. You know, lamenting that studio heads are no longer that creative and willing to take creative risks, but are rather, you know, master marketers who come, uh, you know, more from the marketing side than from the creative side of the film industry. Um, yeah, and, and uh, this whole thing about digital media and such, uh, changing, changing the rules of the game, you know, and as, as you mentioned here, you know, Disney, Disney choosing to create its own streaming service is as much a big, big bit of news in the movie business as it is in the television business because, you know, we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to have to uh, uh, subscribe to D Disney streaming service in order to see those Pixar, Lucasfilm, uh, uh, you know, Disney movies now. So, um, so this is going to continue to change. Uh, the whole way that movies are made and financed and stuff, for sure. So there we go. Uh, so we'll, we'll catch up on the exam questions for this next week. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about social science um, research into the, in, you know, the electronic media. So, and that will be our last week of content. So and then we'll just focus in on uh, Essays and on the, uh, on the exam, the final exam. There we go.